In the meantime, I'm going to pass around some samples here. Um, a couple of girders. One's a box girder, pretty straightforward, rivets on the outside. Another one, this black one, is an H girder, where I just, I just as an experiment, decided to see exactly how many rivets I could stick on one piece of plastic. <laughs> And I think there are 1,400 plus rivets on that thing. And I didn't have to draw each one individually, which is the So you're a true rivet counter? Oh, yeah. 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 So those are the uh, archer rivets? In this case, I'm a rivet creator. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's an interesting well, let me Let me circulate this one first. Here's, here's the first 3D print I did. And the reason why I got into this is I wanted a true scale uh, B and L CPL dwarf signal. So this was the first one I did, and it came out very nice. And I said, "Oh, that stuff works." So this is to actual scale done from the G uh, General Railway signal plans. Okay, and you can't get anything like that commercially, which leads to why we do 3D printing. At least why I do, because I can get stuff that I cannot get commercially. So we'll give people another minute or two. One more minute. You can see it. Yeah, it's amazing. Look at this. Do you use shake waves? <coughs> Most of my stuff is done on shake weights, yes, or a, a company in France called Sculptio, which is very similar to shake weights, except I find they have less attitude. They ship faster, and their machines are a little bit better. <coughs> well, they, they're polite. French? Okay. The French, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hard as it is to believe, my, my youngest daughter went to Paris this year and was regaled by exactly how polite the people were. You know, maybe they've had an attitude adjustment. I don't know. Well, I can do involved with uh, makeup. I, but that's gorgeous. Say again, I'm sorry. Have you ever gotten involved with makeup? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. Okay, so let's let's get started. But before we do, <coughs> let's bow our heads for a few seconds because today is September 11th. Let's remember those people who died uh, 14 years ago that they never be forgotten. My name is Terry Terrence, and yes, I'm an old scaler. Uh, I've always been an old scaler, so I'm not one of those people who came over from HORN. Um, this is a clinic, as you can see from the copyright date, that I did last year here at the Old Scale National, so this is a repeat, um, if you didn't see it last year. So, 3D printing for model railroaders. What I'm going to attempt to do is give you an overview of the state of the art for 3D printing, how to prepare a model for 3D printing, and hopefully give you enough encouragement, enough knowledge that you'll go out and try this for yourself. You can try a 3D print probably for less than 20 bucks, okay, if you want to try your hand at that. And that's by using free software like SketchUp, okay, having it printed at a print house like um, uh, Shapeways. Over here on this little diorama, everything you see that is in green terrain or track structure has been 3D printed. So we have uh, a, uh, a PRR and a, um, actually I should have turned this around, a Pennsylvania Railroad and a b and Railroad telephone box. You can't see some of that behind this locomotive. Uh, Penn C and b and whistle posts. A Pennsylvania Railroad, I'm sorry, a b and Railroad a concrete telephone booth. Now that's a casting from a 3D printed master, which we'll go into. The uh, catenary poles are what started it all. Someone asked me, could I do catenary poles? And I said, yeah, I think I can. And for all the enthusiasm and the oohs and owls that the catenary poles got, no one ever bought any. <laughs> 
Um, over you. here we have a 3D printed body for the long neglected and off this life uh, O scale Atlas switchers from the 70s. This one is a generic body that could be diesel, gas mechanical, electric, or even trolley. Uh, it's kept generic so that uh, you can add the details of your choice and make it into what you want. This other one, this new cab, changes the same Atlas switcher into an FN2 critter. So this is done to 1 to 22.5 or whatever F scale is. Uh, we also have the little B&O dwarf signal on here. So these are just some examples of what you can do with 3D printing. So let, let's get started through the slides. Okay, now it's going to make a liar out of me. Why is this not? So what we're going to talk about, what is 3D printing, why would you want to do 3D printing, um, and how to try it without spending a lot, and we're going to go through the actual how you do it, should you buy a 3D printer, questions, and I'll do a demonstration of time permits. Okay? Stop me and ask questions at any point in this presentation. 3D printing is the very catchy name for what started out being called rapid prototyping and is now called additive manufacturing. That gives it a patina of respectability. In fact, where I work, you know, they call it additive manufacturing or AM. Um, it covers many, many different processes to print largely in plastic, but you can use many, many other materials nowadays, including metals. <laughs> Okay, and including tissue, human, actually human tissue, that people are actually 3D printing human tissue. The models are built up much in the way your inkjet printer builds up an image. But instead of just putting droplets of ink in an XY direction, plastic or some other material is deposited in XY, and then when that first layer is finished, they build another layer on top of it, usually by dropping the build table and then laying down another XY pattern. Yes, sir? Okay. Depends on the process. Okay, so the thickness of the layer is process dependent with what they call fused deposition modeling, which is all the consumer level desktop printers. It can go down to maybe 100 microns or a tenth of a millimeter. Okay, but to do that, it's going to take a long time to print something. With some of the other processes, like was done with that CPL dwarf, where you're using a liquid plastic, it can get a lot finer than that. Okay, uh, so, um, so I think I've covered over here. The, for the moment, plastic and wax give you the highest resolution. The wax printers can be used as a master for an investment casting. That's where they would intersect with our hobby. All right. There are more and more materials they're figuring out how to 3D print every day. This literally will change week by week with the company announcing some new material that they've been able to 3D print. So just keep up with with you know, current uh, uh, developments. Why would you want to 3D print? Well, I think we talked about one before we started the, the presentation. You want to make prototype specific models that aren't available commercially. Okay, particularly true if you model at a railroad or a time period which isn't popular. No, it's unlikely a manufacturer is going to come along and produce the models that you need. You can make detailed parts. This is a really good sweet spot for 3D printing in O scale. Okay, making detailed parts, especially since, gee whiz, 
all the detail part manufacturers in all scale are pretty much gone. Um, make parts for rolling stock and structures. Lionel makes a beautiful Baltimore, Ohio I-12 caboose, and I have a pass log. And one day I was trying to figure, I was trying to adapt Rich Yoder's wonderful caboose trucks to the Lionel body, and I was fabricating something out of shouldered washers and styrene tube, and then I went, duh! I can design this in 20 minutes, read and print it, and forego all that work. And this is the result. These kingpins, for lack of a better term, will adapt the Lionel undercarriage to the Rich Yoder trucks. There's nine of them there arranged on a tree. Now the tree, when you arrange something on a tree in 3D printing, it's not necessary like it is in casting, but since all the 3D print houses charge you by the piece they have to handle, it makes sense to put multiple pieces on, on a tree. So that was a tremendous labor saver, but it falls under the making parts for rolling stock and structures. You can make line side detail. Look over here on this diorama. <clears throat> How much of this is line side detail? The, the telephone boxes, whistle posts, telephone booth, catenary pole, all that's line side detail. Another sweet spot for 3D printing in O scale because these don't cost that very much to 3D print and they add a whole lot of, of detail to your model railroad. You know, for instance, in this particular case of the b and whistle post, it has the characteristic b and shape, has the impressed W on there, just needs paint at this point. Uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad one had, was cast iron. This was the original PRR design. has the ribs on the back, okay, which is also neat in all scale. What is that, resin? No. Okay, so, um, print and tire car and locomotive bodies. You can see it can be done, but beyond the scale of this body here for this critter, or this cab for that critter, it starts to get expensive in all scale. In the smaller scales, though, it becomes very competitive with commercial products, especially for models that you can't get. I know people in HON3, who are doing very specific, or actually I should say HON42, who are doing very specific models for the Buckins narrow gauge railroad on Newfoundland. You know, who, what commercial manufacturer is going to produce cars for that? Um, you can print masters used for casting. So I told you that this telephone booth is a solid resin casting done from a 3D printed master. Well, here is that master right here. I'm going to pass this around and start on this side this time, just to be fair. That was the 3D printed master, which was then sealed in paint because the nylon material was printed in it porous. And then I asked uh, Martin, who's out in the hall there, and is a member of our local group down in the Washington, D.C. area, to cast those for me. And as castings, they came out beautifully. In fact, I'll start the casting around for the other side of the room. Um, as castings, they came out beautifully, and they're very economical as castings. Do you use the same alloy for all of your work? I used, largely I used what, the, uh, what Shapeways calls white, strong, and flexible plastic. It's a selectively laser-centered nylon okay, material, and that's because it's inexpensive, it's strong, uh, the detail it level isn't the highest, but in O scale, it's pretty useful. There are other processes, and you have, when you're thinking about doing a model, you also have to think about what process am I going to print it in. Because that process will dictate the smallest feature you can put on the model, the thinnest wall section you can put on the model, the strength of the model. So as you're thinking, I want uh, an O-scale whistle post, you have to think, okay, does it have to be strong? What's, what's the level of detail that I need? Okay? And then you can match that to a process. And you can go on to the Shapeways 
website and they will tell you the capabilities of each material, each process. Yes, sir. Uh, say we were starting with that whistle post. Mm -hmm. Did you start with a drawing or out of a book or something? Boy, you're a great straight man. Just wait a few slides. It's in the presentation. And I didn't pay him to do that either. All right, so here are some pictures of, of the models you see on the diorama. Yes, sir. The, the uh, upright panels on that have a rough texture. The, that's, well, when you see, when the master gets to your side, you'll see the textures from the uh, master. So okay. it's intentional? And it's, it's a byproduct of the, of the process used. I didn't find it objectionable. When I pick up the casting, it feels like concrete. Yes. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, from three feet away, you can't tell the, t the surface texture. Okay? And it's possible that you, you can use another process like what I use for the B&O CPL Dwarf. That comes out a lot finer surface texture. But it's a much more expensive process. Okay? Um, how can you do this without spending a lot of time or effort? Sure. And this is where we'll get into the whistle post example in a slide or two. Um, you can use free software. And if you can do Etch-a-Sketch, you can use something like SketchUp to design something simple like a whistle post. Okay? You don't need your own 3D printer because you can send it off to a printing service like Shapeways. Um, let's see. There are model sharing websites. Yes, Jim? In regards to that, for you to buy your own 3D printer to get the same quality as you do out of Shapeways would cost you... At least twenty thousand. Yeah, twenty thousand dollars. So, so the two thousand dollar micro micro. <laughs> the two thousand okay. dollar micro micro. And you're another great straight man. Okay. <laughs> Here is a one forty eight scale car that I took a one twenty four scale car and I had access to a ridiculously expensive professional scanner. I scanned the car had the model reduced, and the model still needs work, but you can take, look at this, and see what type of surface texture you're going to get out of a desktop 3D printer. Now, I have to work on that model some more, I can make it better. And it's going to be a casting master when I'm finished, but I will have to go over it with Spot Buddy, smooth everything out, and then use it as a casting master, okay? So, and there are many things you can use a desktop printer for. You just have to match it to what you want to do. Yes, right. And generally, it, they do big well. So mm -hmm. a car does real well. If you want to do an itty bitty little part like his dwarfs, it doesn't do that very well. Okay. Yeah, that, and that's, that's another, good, another good point. For us O scalers, for us to do cars economically, say you want a fleet of some car type that you can't get commercially. That's when you probably will want to look into a desktop 3D printer. Because to print, say, a, a 40 foot car at Shapeways is probably going to push 100 bucks just for the shell. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And if you get the good detail on it, it could be three, three or four hundred dollars. Can you take an existing model and somehow scale up? Scan it, take the existing model, photograph it, or scan it somehow, and duplicate that. Right now, I'm looking into consumer grade scanners. They're not ready for prime time yet. You could send the model off to be scanned, like I did with that car, okay? But that would cost you anywhere from $500 to $1,500 so before you buy a real one scan. Okay? <laughs> that car would not have been possible, <laughs> save for the fact that where I work, I had access to a $80,000 scanner. Uh -huh. Okay? So you can see if a company's invested $80,000 in a laser scanner, that they can charge you 500 bucks to do a scan. I looked into uh, make or buy about six mm -hmm. months ago, primarily because they had a duplicator, mm -hmm. had a camera type of thing, and right. put a prototype on it, and, and then you can duplicate that. Mm -hmm. the people they worked okay for things with a lot of texture, 
that are relatively amorphous. When you look at the desktop scanner advertisement, they'll always show you them scanning in someone's face. No. Well, there's not a lot of detail in someone's face. There's a lot of smooth contours, which those scanners do very well. But there's not like rivets, okay, or trim on an automobile. Look at that automobile. You'll see even there the trim is muted. And I'm going to have to fix that on the model before I, I print it finally and use it as a casting mask. So scanning isn't quite there yet. This software you talked about, mm -hmm. uh, I'm interested in doing driver centers. Would it have mm -hmm. enough power to do that? You would probably not want to use SketchUp for that because there are contours that SketchUp mm -hmm. would have a hard time with. I had a little experience with Pro-E, but it was very frustrating. Pro-E has a large learning curve. I'll let Jim talk to SolidWorks because, Jim, you use SolidWorks. Yeah, Solid. SketchUp is a great tool. It doesn't do small things well. SolidWorks would do it better. Have you, uh, were you in the military? No. Do you have anybody in your family who was in the military? No. Do you have anybody in your family who was a student? Yes. Okay. Uh, the student version, and you have to like draw blood practically with Solid. SolidWorks is a seven thousand dollar program that you pay. It's like thirty five hundred dollars a year, but it's worth it. It's, it's actually worth it, way, yeah. but um, if you have a student, you can get a version for a hundred dollars, <laughs> and to pay it's for one year, and then pay twenty five dollars for the express shipping to get it. If you have no anybody who's been in the military, you can get it for twenty bucks. Does it put a, a okay. thing Where across the ground? Fifty years ago. Yes. Yeah, my father was in the military in the in the sixties. All you need is your all you need is a valid DD two fourteen. If you have that, you can get all the works for twenty dollars. Yeah, and if you have a choice between the free SketchUp and twenty dollars SolidWorks, go with the you get no support, you get no nothing. You get a box with the disc in it for twenty for twenty bucks. But um, you can go online and see YouTube and all this other stuff to tell you anything you want to do. And and the, the tutorials that come with the disc are very nice. So I mean, if you have your choice, if you can do it, you know, student, hundred dollars, draw blood. You'll understand when you look at the student thing, or military twenty dollars. Well, the AutoCAD student version I'm familiar with. Uh, you couldn't plot anything out that didn't have this banner across it stating that it was a student. SolidWorks is a little thing at the bottom of the screen that says this was created with a student edition, but it doesn't get imprinted into the STL files okay. which you need to send off. Mm. As long as you're not making money, they don't care. Mm. Is it solid? SolidWorks. Solid well, uh, if you look on the internet, SolidWorks and uh, Veteran. Just look on SolidWorks and Veteran, and you'll it'll come up with. So they're very good about it. You just they give you a form to fill out, very simple. Send us a copy of your DDU 14. Within a week, you have a twenty dollars SolidWorks, and it's just for shit. You get it free. You pay twenty dollars to ship it. <laughs> okay. anyway. All right. So. The limitation, especially for us O-scalers, is that 3D prints are priced when you send them off by the volume of material used and with the factor in there for the machine time. So on the smaller scales, TT, N, you can actually print something cheaper than you can buy commercially. It's not going to be the same quality, but you can actually, you know, print something very inexpensively. In old scale, it becomes prohibitive, and that's where you start to think about your own desktop machine. Okay, um, let's move on. This was your, with your machine? No, that was with a lose bot at the uh, Hack DC. Okay, my, yeah, the, my machine would do the same, but I haven't assembled my machine yet. So how would we do this? Three easy steps, and the <laughs> easiest sort of sarcasm here, okay? New and improved, right? Uh, so you design the model, repair the mesh, and send it off to the printers. In fact, nowadays, you don't even have to repair the mesh. You can upload a raw file to SolidWorks or any other websites, and they'll repair the mesh for you. But I left it in here for completeness. 
uh, you can get three, your, get your 3D design software, the free one, to sketch up Autodesk, Blender, Tinkercad, FreeCAD. Commercial software, you have Rhino, Lightweight, AutoCab, Inventure, and, and, and of course SolidWorks, which is everyone considers the best out there. Uh, you may be able to use these tools at work. Be sure you ask for permission first. There's no way losing your job because you're using their tools for your private modeling pursuits. Okay? Uh, and then we talked about inexpensive student licenses. SolidWorks is the only one that offers a student license. Some of these commercial programs offer various grades of licenses with it. Increasing or decreasing limitations on the SGIF. One I know about rhinoceros, SolidWorks the student license is it's hundred dollars every year. Rhinoceros is hundred dollars forever. You know, for instance. Mm -hmm. If you know it. I'm told it's a great program, but every one of these things has a learning curve. Yeah, and every one has its adherence and detractors. So you pay your money and take your choice. But the important thing is you have a lot of good free choices, so if we're trying to do this cheaply, you have options. Um, I recommend SketchUp. It's free, it's intuitive, it's well supported with an active user community and hundreds if not thousands of videos on YouTube that show you how to do everything. Uh, it's a small footprint in that it will run on older computers. Okay, without too much you know, fall at all. It's not so good at curved surfaces. Okay? It's it was designed for architectural pursuits. So anything that you can do in XYZ coordinates, straight surfaces, you're good to go with SketchUp. And SketchUp is not a true solid model. It's a surface modeler. Now that doesn't necessarily make much difference. But every, just for your information, everything you design in, in SketchUp is hollow. In fact, you can even zoom in and get inside your model and look around on the inside. Right? When, you, when you output the file, it doesn't make a difference, but I just thought I'd mention that. Well, yes. it does. It does and it doesn't. It's, it, it, really tricky. But when you're learning it, you have to understand that when you draw things in SketchUp, it leaves pieces inside. That's why the whole thing about it being a surface model. There's things inside the model, and you can't see them, but when you send it off to Shapeways, they'll see it, and it suddenly becomes multifaceted, and then it becomes more difficult for them to print it. It's The only reason I know this is I spent a month of a month drawing a model, and there's this long story about <coughs> shells that I look into. Yeah. Well, let's not let's not geek out yeah. here, Jim. Okay. <laughs> oh no, it's just you 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 go mad. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so when you're starting to do your model, think about your model. I like to start from plans or plans or measurements. Okay. So I did that fancy whistle post from what I measured up in Maryland. Okay. Um, now you have a decision to make. Are you going to work in inches or millimeters? And I suggest working directly in the model dimensions. So don't do it in feet and inches and then say I'm going to scale it down. Because that introduces a whole bunch of other visibil uh, variability. So if you're going to do it in O scale, figure out what the O scale equivalent inches and feet is. So for instance, one inch in O scale, 0208, or 5283 millimeters. And then you have HO and N scale for your three major scales. And then work directly in those dimensions. Which means if you're going to move a model from one scale to the next, you have to redraw it. You'll save yourself a whole lot of grief by doing that. Um, Think about which material and process will, print, will fit your model. Now we talked briefly about this, okay? So your minimum wall cross-section in many of the processes, including that white plastic that you've all seen now, is about eight-tenths of a millimeter. I like to stay away from the minimum and keep that to about a millimeter. 
So if you need to do real thin sections, that this process may not be for you. Now these are two millimeter walls on here. I did that for structural thickness and to make sure that I didn't get into a do loop with Shapeways on printing this, okay? I also have some recesses behind the windows to put in microscope cover glasses, glass. So I wanted to emboss detail into the walls. I made them extra thick, but you can't see those walls, okay? So I could make them thick there. Surface detail again, about two tenths of a millimeter, eight thousandths of an inch. Again, the closer you work to the minimums, the more likely it is that the, the technician at Shapeways in Brooklyn, who has to put your model into the machine and set it up on the platform will say, you know what, I don't want to be bothered with this and he'll just reject it. Which is why I do the minimum at Shapeways that I can. Um, watch your maximum overall size. When you go to this Shapeways website, they will tell you what the maximum size model can be produced in each material and process. Again, this white plastic has the largest model. I couldn't do these catenary poles in any other plastic. Well, actually, you can. There's a plastic with aluminum dust in it, but it's effectively the same process. That's this stuff here. This is aluminum dust in the same white plastic. I just did this to see what it looks like. I don't like it any better. But uh, some of them, like the B&O miniature signal, they, you can't do a very large model in that. Okay? Um, most 3D design tools allow you to create basic shapes. So as you're thinking of your model, think, break it down into a series of basic shapes. So when I, for instance, did this cap, okay, I did this cap, I started with a box. All right, I started with a square and I extruded that up into a box. Then I shaved off the roof to give it a slight curvature. Then I punched the windows through. So you're working with basic kindergarten shapes, and you have to work with those shapes and orient them to make more complex structures, especially if you're using SketchUp. Does it give you a history tree? I'm sorry? Does it give you a history tree that you can use to manipulate your model? No. So you, can, you can't undo multiple steps on SketchUp, <laughs> but that's about it. Okay? So you just have to put some thought into how I'm going to build the model, okay? Uh, it's not that difficult, but you need to think about it in advance, because otherwise what happens is you get into the model, realize you can't do something, and I have to back out many steps, losing, many, uh, you know, losing hours, and realizing, you know, I don't want to do that again. Yeah. yeah, a lot of times you end up deciding just to redraw it. Yeah, just redraw it. You'll save time. Okay. Um, here you go. It was more than a couple slides. So how, how did I draw this whistle post? Well, I started with a rectangle. So this is the, the sketch of X, Y, and Z axes. I started with a rectangle that was approximately the head <laughs> of the whistle post. I then pulled that up, extruded it up into a square. I then cut it to shape. You'll see these dotted lines here when you look at this on your the disc that you'll receive. Those are guidelines. So I was working from the B&O plans. I laid out my guidelines, and then I put my cuts in here. And how do you cut? Well, you draw a line from here to there, and then Shapeways cuts along that line. And then I can take the piece that's on the other side of the cut line, I can take it away. Okay, I actually, just like I pulled it up, I can push it down into the, into the ground, into nothingness. It'll, okay. show you, it'll show you a measurement over here as you're doing that or something? You can do that. Down here in the lower right corner, I'm thinking, yes, you do see it on the screen captures. This box, it's not going to show well on the projection, shows you the dimension that you're working with. So you can, when I did this, this rectangle, yeah. I put in the exact dimensions in scale yeah. in inches 
using my scale factor so that the head came out to the right shape. And same thing with the guidelines. I laid all those out so that they're absolutely precise. So now at this step, I have the head entirely formed. And then the easy thing was I grabbed this surface, which represents the shaft, and I just pulled it out. Just said, I want to pull this out so many inches. Done. And then I took the text tool. I found a nice bold W, in case you're interested, the font is Tahoma bold. Okay, I forget what the size was, but I sized it according to the drawing that I had. And uh, I put it in place. It, when you do the text tool, they give you a dialog box that asks you whether you want it in Boston or depressed. And I said, you know, I'm sorry, uh, uh, raised or depressed. Okay, I said I wanted it depressed. I put it in place here. And then the one trick was I put it in place, and all I got was an outline of the letter. Then I realized I had to click on the top surface and just make it go away. And there was the letter embossed into the material. So once you know how to do this, this is like 30 minutes work to do something very, very simple. So if you have a concrete or wood or otherwise solid whistle post for your railroad that you want to try, it's a good place as any to give, it, give this a shot. Then what you can do is, and I don't have this in the slides, is you can then group this whole thing together just like you would on a PowerPoint slide or something and reproduce it and put five or six of them on a tree because Shapeways is going to charge you. Let me see if I can get a tree out here. It's out of my box here. Shapeways is going to charge you for each piece they have to handle. And this simply is a, a way to beat their charge system. So if you were just doing one whistle post, they'd have $1.50 just for handling that piece. But put six of them on a, on a tree, I don't want to call it a sprue, and it's still the same dollar fifty. So here's a bunch of the whistle posts. So, last step, we're coming down the whole stretch. We talked about don't work too close to the minimums. Duplicate and group functions are your friend. The duplicate function allowed me to put 1,400 rivets on that girder in hardly any time at all. And I just did that just to see if, you know, how that would work. Okay. Um, save your design frequently in different files, you know, numbered like you know, body formed, roof formed, windows formed, and so that you don't have to back all the way up if you get into a dead end. Um, you can check your work occasionally by saving it, uploading it to Shapeways, and seeing A, what it's going to cost, and B, they will tell you whether it's printable or not. Okay, so you can check your work frequently. And it doesn't cost you anything to do that. You create an account on Shapeways. Uh, Shapeways, is, they send you an email every now and again about sales and such like, but you can just screen them out if you don't want to be bothered. Um, Make your model hollow, if at all possible, okay? Because you're being charged by the cubic centimeter for the material, all right? That gets back to that concrete telephone booth. I had to hollow this guy out because I did it solid. I uploaded it to Shapeways and went <laughs> at the price, okay? Even hollow was too expensive to print each one individually. So I would have to go back and make it hollow. So make it hollow from the beginning if it has significant volume. Even these B&O telephone boxes, it was worthwhile hollowing those out. You can see there's a hollow in there. Um, look under the bottom of the box. You know, and if you tell me, well, what if someone wants to look at the bottom of the box? I, I have no answer for that one. No, you can use, I mean, <laughs> the answer to that is you can make the bottom of the box but you have to make it as a separate part. So you sprue it. Yes. You sprue it on the inside, and then you just hang it underneath. 
and then you just I mean, cut it off and glue it in. Because you know, yeah. yeah. I've done that with, with, with boxes. <laughs> yeah. But that's where you come into the whole shell thing. Is if it thinks there's too many shells in there, there when it just pieces inside the model because it's, as he said, it's a surface, not a solid. So if it thinks there's a lot of things in there, their software gets confused and they'll fill it in. And so your your model that should be fifteen dollars to print suddenly becomes seven hundred dollars. Yeah. Well, which is a good. Great segue to the next slide, which is fixing the mesh. What Jim is talking about is mathematically, any model you do in any CAD software, as far as I know, is represented as a mesh of triangles. There's a mathematical reason for this. Triangles can be joined to form an approximation of any surface. Okay, so if you you can get software and you can actually look at this mesh, okay? And the defects can be inside the model or you can have holes in the surface of the model. Well, if you have holes in the surface of the model, it can't be printed. So there are programs out there, NetFab is the big one. Now, NetFab in the last couple of years has hooked up somehow with Microsoft. And so now when you go to the NetFab online uh, website to fix your model, it's going to see Microsoft 3D printing. Okay, now you just have to endure it, but uh, they, they, they can fix your model. So once you've got everything set and you write out your model as this STL file, which is the stereolithography format, you upload it to NetFab. They require that you have a Microsoft login. Since I have a Hotmail account, that works. That's my universal Microsoft stamped ID number. Next, they'll tattoo it on my forearm or something. Okay? Um, and then you upload your file, and literally in a couple of minutes, it'll, it'll notify you it's ready to download. That's the nice thing about this now. It's running on some very fast servers somewhere in the Microsoft cloud. Okay? And it will come back and you'll see a fixed file. Now the thing you have to guard against is exactly what Jim said. If you made your model hollow, when it comes out of the repair process, make sure it's still hollow. Sometimes it'll look at that and close up your cavities and you'll have to go back and, and try a different way of doing it. The story that I had was I had a hollow model, sent it to Shapeways, it came back as being, I think, $720 to print it. And I said, how is this possible? And support said, well, your model's too big. And I could see it was hollow. So I made all the, hall I made all the walls of the model to the exact specifications of the smallest, thinnest wall I could make. I sent it to shape, and this took a week, because I didn't know what I was doing. I sent it to Shapeways, and it came out as $7 more expensive. And so, I literally sent the message back to the support guy and I said, look, Mr. Smarty Pants. Uh, I just made all the, and then he finally actually looked at it and said, oh, there's too many shells on the mall. It closed up the ball. So it didn't matter what you did, it's going to think. The shells, when, when, when SketchUp makes something, there's walls inside the net, inside what you're looking at. You have to make sure all that's gone. So that's, that's, Don't let that but, scare you off. But the net net the net fab will fix that. Mm -hmm. So don't don't let that scare you off. No. You know, Jim and I can be a little bit geeky about Sorry. this. Sorry. Okay. Start with something simple, a yeah. whistle post, a uh, you know, something very simple, and you're not likely to no. have this problem. Okay? I'm just mentioning it here for completeness. Someone asked me before why I send it off to a French company. Because the technicians at Shapeways are typical people from Brooklyn. I'm a native New Yorker, so I know. I ain't gonna fix that thing. <laughs> hey, forget about it. <laughs> You're all one word. Yeah. Bear it down just a little bit and you'll have it. <laughs> yeah, but they're in Brooklyn, not down south. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, that's how you fix it. But the key thing is now, 
Shapeways and other companies will take your SketchUp model and do all that behind the scenes. Okay? I still like to use NetFab because I can take, I, there's a NetFab desktop program you can get. Okay? I can look at the mesh. I can see what it changed. Okay? I can go back and maybe rearrange a model if it's doing something I don't like. And with Shapeways, you know, the guys up in Brooklyn just don't care. <laughs> okay. Um, two ways to print. Send your model through 3D printing service. And we've already touched on all of these. Higher accuracy, better surface finish. You don't have to spend any money. No need to learn how to run your machine. But you have the higher cost per model and shipping costs. And by the way, you can wait for Shapeways to do a free shipping weekend or 15% off. Especially if you have a lot of models ready to print, 15% off is a great money saver. Um, buy or borrow a desktop printer. We'll talk about borrowing in a minute. You have the cost of acquiring, feeding, and learning how to run the printer. However, as we've talked about, if you're going to print entire O-scale cars, this is probably the only economical way to go. Okay. One of the things when I get my 3D printer kit assembled is the you know, cantilever signal tower, signal uh, bridge. Okay, that's one of the things I want to print, which I'm not even going to try at Shapeways. Too much intricate girder detail in there, which I want to make near minimum printable dimension. It just not going to deal with those guys in that sense. Okay. So we'll talk just a little bit more about this and then we're going to be pretty much um, done. Off to the printing service. Not every printing service offers every material and process. So look at Shapeways, Sculptio, Pocono, um, I materialized, except that last time I used I or looked at I materialized, there were shipping charges, ridiculous. If the the cheapest product they have there is similar to that, is mm -hmm. to the, the white strong and flexible, and I actually like the surface better. Yes, the, yes. the, the shipping <coughs> charge is nominal. It's slightly more money than Shapeways, but the surface is better. So yeah. and you're talking of that gray stuff. There. Right. No, it was white. White. Okay. I haven't used iMaterialize, so. No, the only reason I used the only reason I used it is, yeah. and it, I'll say this really quickly because you want mm -hmm. the whole thing with a million triangles. Uh, right. I had something. I had something that was over a million. Let's let's, let's yeah. not go into that. Moving here, on to this will make people's heads explode. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, and by the way, I have all of these services in the resources on the last slide, so we can see what we're talking. about. Um, all of the printers, commercial printers, will run your model through their software to check it for printability. That's the last hurdle you have to get over. But once you've done that, and they'll complain things are too thin or otherwise screwed up, that's why the admonition for your first several models stay well away from the minimal printable dimension until you get some experience doing this. Um, once you pass all that and your model has passed the screening test, you can place your order. All of the services will show you on the, on the screen on their website what your model will look like. And you can rotate it around and look at it from all different angles. They will tell you what size it will print to. Be sure you check that out because there's sometimes they don't get it right. And then they'll allow you to rescale it a little bit if, the, if it's wrong, okay? Um, their production time can be anything from like four or five days to three weeks or so, depending on the material and, and which service you're at. Um, so, okay, so it's actually not even on the last slide. We have Sculptio, Shapeway, Pocono, and iMaterializer right here on the bottom of this slide. So you have all their websites there. Shapeways now, they're, they're white, they're, no, they're, they're FUD, they're frosted over detail, you can mm -hmm. get that stuff in a week, it's amazing. Yeah, it used to be a longer time. Yeah. Okay, desktop 3D printing. 
my advice is, unless you're really a first adopter, not yet. Okay, although this Da Vinci XYZ uh, from XYZ Printing, Da Vinci Printer from XYZ Printing, I saw it in a micro center uh, computer store. The prints were not that bad. It's like 500 bucks. The drawback is you have to buy their filament because it's, it's what they call chipped filament. It's like buying a, a Canon 3D uh, uh, inkjet printer cartridge. There's a chip in there and it won't take counterfeit goods. Um, surface finish and accuracy are still lacking. For most machines, except like the one I bought, their build volume is still relatively small. You might have to use a dedicated computer. But the steep learning curve is, is one of the main obstacles. Like I said, you can now get reasonable $500 computers. As a matter of fact, MCM Electronics is blowing out the last generation of three, uh, uh, 3D systems cube printer for 600 bucks. Also requires chipped fiber, but it has a much larger support system than the DaVinci. So the price is getting down. All right. If you don't have to use the chip fiber, the, ma the printing material is very inexpensive. You can get two kilograms of filament for under $15, and you can get it off the shelf. That's really pretty amazing, okay? So you can print two kilograms of finished model, or a little bit less, because they'll be waste. Uh, two kilograms of finished model for 15 bucks. And that thick. That being said, the models I have, because I've done that, I got Micro Center filament for fourteen dollars. Yeah. The part is this big, and it doesn't weigh anything. Yeah. So. Well, it's like a car model. Yeah. That's solid. Okay. And that was done with, uh, actually, that's styrene. That's not even ABS. Mm -hmm. It's printable styrene. Okay. Desktop stereolithography. The UV cured liquid process is here. The guy at Rusty Stumps out in the hall here, he has one. You can go ask and look at his uh, 3D printed samples. I talked to another gentleman who has a desktop, uh, the same desktop printer called the Form 1. He says it's very touchy about cleanliness. That was a uh, stemple, mm -hmm. you know, Peter. Um, very touchy about cleanliness. So using a liquid process isn't quite there yet. Okay, I would say wait, it's getting better by the day. But if you really get turned on by this, and when I get in the mood to do 3D design, I'll sit at the computer for days and the, the layout will be neglected and you just get into it because it's a very creative process. You know, you're creating at the very basic level. Um, here are your resources. Now, Let's talk about makerspaces and hackerspaces. If you want to try this out and get someone to help you, there are what are called makerspaces and hackerspaces. These are the guys in the robotics community and the real geeks. I mean, these are serious. These people are beyond the pocket protector in the class. <laughs> okay. They have them, we have one in the DC area called Hack DC, and they allow anybody to walk in and use their machines, and they'll help you. That's how I got this guy printed, okay? Uh, they will help you. Um, they didn't even charge me for the filament, okay? So, in fact, they want people to utilize their machines so they can justify their existence. So, lo look up your local hacker space. <laughs> Just remember one thing, you're going into their world and you know, they're, you know, you're probably thinking of them, hey, you guys are making little toy robots and you think you're changing the world. And they're thinking, what the hell is a grown man playing with trains? <laughs> <laughs> okay. One other resource that isn't in these slides that I found out about recently is a website called Make XYZ. These are hobbyists who have a 3D printer. They will take your fully finished files, so you have to take them from SketchUp, prepare the mesh, 
send them off to these guys, and they will print it for you and send you back the model. The prices are exceedingly reasonable because they're not in it to make money. So it's make X, Y, Z. I didn't think about putting it into the resources. Okay? So if you remember that website, and it could be even locally, so you could even go and pick up your model. You may not even have to mail it. Okay? So those are, those are some of the things you can do. What's on the horizon? Consumer-friendly desktop printers. Ones that are more like an appliance. That's really where I'm going with this. Okay? 3D scanners at consumer prices, not there yet. In, in June, I went to a maker fair, brought with me a 124 scale car, had it scanned on several de on, on consumer level scanners. It was a miserable failure on each one. Okay? So we're not there yet. But when it is, you'll close that loop on creation. You'll be able to scan something, uh, modify the model, print it, and you're on your way. How did you determine that the, the, the scans were, was it output on the screen? All you had to do was look at it. Oh, okay. So it was it just, on it, a, it a, a video screen? Wasn't, it wasn't capturing the model. Okay. It wasn't even close. I okay. mean, there were yeah. holes and, you know, it's just horrible. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, this cleaning, cleaning up the 3D model and, and the striations and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff, do you have any recommendations on how to do that? There is a epoxy from SmoothOn, the same people that make the casting materials, that you can apply to the model to remove the striations. If you print in ABS, there's also a process you can use uh, acetone vapor smoothing, but that's going to make your model look melted. Maybe that's acceptable, okay? Uh, it gives me the willies because you're heating up acetone in a vessel. Uh, that's not something I want to be around. But you know, look, at, look at it on YouTube and all the geeks are doing it. So. I've tried to smooth on and it looks okay. This, this, this car's got ends that I okay, use. Smooth smooth on. On. Okay, smooth on. Okay. Yeah, it's smooth on. Sandpaper. Yeah. Can you sandpaper or something? Yes. Like that? Yeah. You can sandpaper. I find it gums your sandpaper very quickly. For instance, with this model, I probably use automotive spot putty and then sand that because okay. that's designed to be sanded. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I didn't introduce at the beginning Jim Lincoln, who's a friend of mine, also a very accomplished 3D printer and P48 modeler. You can take a look at some of his work. Um, and Jim, you may want to give the name of your shop on Shapeways. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, Shapeways forward slash shops forward slash Bats by Jim. Bats by Jim. Thank you. But yeah, these, that end, as you see it, both ends, both ends are on a sprue and it's available for sale. But that, that's, see, this is the type of thing you can do with 3D printing. That's, as it essentially comes from Shapeways, that cross over the brake platform, printed with Shapeways, it actually came with a brake wheel, but I broke it off. I see that. It, the brake wheel, was, I still have it, but the release pawl and everything, that can't, the chain obviously is separate, but um, that, that, the bolster is printed in Shapeways. These trucks, are actually 100% except for the wheels and the bearing. 3D printed. Yeah. So you spend a lot of time drawing up this or something. You spend a lot of time Shapeways. You know, well, first, Shapeways you probably wouldn't house. do that. But you SketchUp actually asks you when you finish if you want to share the model. There are model sharing services. I think that was in the slide. There's you know, 3D Warehouse, Thingiverse. There are places where people share. I, I first started this thing, well, maybe there's some commercial potential, but no, there's, there's no real commercial potential. Uh, I probably at some point in a year or two will share all my models out and let people use them as they see fit. The nice thing about the way shape ways works. It's like with my store, I put a little bit of a markup in it. I, it's not very much. But Shapeways charges to give me three and a half percent to maintain the store and sell everything and do everything. So if you have like a card that you think this is the coolest thing and 15 other people, you don't have to stock anything, you don't have to do it, they charge you three and a half percent 
we make a little bit of money. You know, yeah, I make 60 bucks a year, but I also don't have to do anything. <laughs> Yeah, as opposed to make them all. And the real nice thing is that if Jim puts a model out there, I have a model out there, there's a number of people with models out there. If something happens to any of us, you know, it's not like a small manufacturer going out of business. Shapeway yeah. still has the model. You can still get it. That's another one I guess was my question. Yeah. Is it regular? Right. Right. Now that model's done, how do you print it? Yeah. They still have one. They still have one unless you take it down and it will stay up there after you're gone. It's actually fairly stout. You just put your finger on it, it's not going to bust. So yeah, yeah. what I, I was saying around the models that are still, still floating around, so I don't know. Yes. Well, thank you. Well, that's pretty much it. Yeah. We'll be around for questions. Yeah. 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 Yeah.